मैं लिंक डाल देता हूँ अभी वी आर लाइव करके तो अभी आएंगे सब लोग दो तीन मिनट में बट मेरे को बोलो व्हेन व्हेन यू गो लाइव रिद्धि इज गोइंग लाइव ना भी मतलब शी इज इन चार्ज कंट्रोल ना भी हाँ रिद्धि तो म्यूट पे है रिधि तेरी आवाज नहीं आई तो कुछ बोल नहीं दिया नहीं हाँ हाँ वेलकम टू द डे फोर ऑफ हेरिटेज वीक सेलिब्रेशन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू Today we will be discussing, thinking, debating, pondering upon the epigraphical heritage of India. But before we jump into the discussions of epigraphs, let me tell you about Institute Interest. It is an organization which tries to open the vistas of studying of a lot of things like archaeology, astronomy, sciences, music, gardening. You name it, and we have it. For our December schedule, we have. the lectures of dr kurush dalal on uh, the civilizations of southeast asia which will be our series 4 in the civilizations of the world then we have our walk and it is not going to be any other walk but a gaming walk on 4th december where the team members of project khelia will be you know taking you around the mandapeshwar cave and playing games with you there in the cave itself on the board games that were etched there then on 3rd december we have a walk with uh, dr lattu and uh, dr salunke about uh, the uh, the the nature trail about it's going to be a nature trail of the rani bag at baikala then on um, in the month of january the first course of instrusend is going to be the destination courses which is going to be a part 2 of the destination courses the first destination course we already have had at like the, we have already taken it and it's there uploaded on our website um just a second sorry uh, there was a lot of disturbance in the background yeah so i was telling about the upcoming programs at instrusend we are also going to have a walk at elephanta caves with none another other than dr kurish dalal uh, we are also going to have a walk for the caves at karle and bhaje on 5th of february so please do join us for this upcoming events now jumping into the discussions about epigraphs let's get the first things clear few things clear before we begin about the discussions so first things first what is epigraphy epigraphy is the study of epigraphs and what are epigraphs anything that is engraved on a hard surface epigraphy the word is derived from two greek words epi and graphia or graphy epi means on or upon and graphia means to write so any sir any hard surface on which things are inscribed upon or engraved upon are called as epigraphs epigraphs are the study of things on hard surfaces where contrary to that we have manuscripts that are you know about the so the things that are written about this on the soft surfaces so we have the birch bark manuscripts we have the palm leaf manuscripts etc so these are the soft surfaces comparing to them we have epigraphs which are on the hard surfaces um epigraphs are written records which and they distinguish distinguish our past into prehistory because of them our past gets distinguished into prehistory protohistory 
and history so prehistory is that part where there are no written records and history is that part where there are written records and which have been already deciphered on the like in between of these two parts in the study of history we have a period called as proto history where the script is there but we have not been able to decipher it and this is the this is where the indus valley civilization stands as of now epigraphs are considered to be the most reliable, reliable documents of the past um, according to historians and archaeologists because there cannot be any interpolations in them once it's written it's done once it's engraved it's done these are definitely that is why i mean these are called as patthar ki lakir they cannot be changed once they have been engraved when we are talking about the field of epigraphy there are certain associated terms with it like paleography orthography calligraphy like some you know these terms so what is paleography paleography is the study of the development of scripts like you would have read or you know heard people discussing and telling that this inscription is different like this inscription ka script is a satavana brahmi but wo inscription ke script mein gupta brahmi dikhta hai so these kind of things are you know uh, talked about in paleography they tell us how scripts have evolved over the period of time like brahmi script is supposed to be the mother of all the indian scripts today all the scripts that we write today have somewhere or the other originated from brahmi so all this kind of studies are done in the field of paleography um orthography is um how should i define it is the conventions of writing system like what are the basic measurements or you know how are the diacritical mark you marks used or if there is um joint words or jodakshars so how they are fused together so all this comes in the part of orthography in calligraphy uh as you know calligraphy is the art of beautiful handwriting we also study inscriptions through that lens whether they have been carved properly not have not been carved properly like what what is the overall condition is the script clear to read or we really need to rack our brains as to understand what is written in it what do we learn from them well if inscriptions are understood properly we learn everything from them as dr dc sarkar clearly summarizes it there is no aspect of life culture and activities of the indians that is not reflected in the inscriptions without them many things would have been unclear to us till now so we learn almost everything about india's past india's present from these kind of little chota mota big small inscriptions uh, why do we need them now this question i leave it unanswered here right now as of now and maybe you can tell me in the comment section later on that why do we need them after we finish this session the scope of epigraphy now this word scope is i mean relatable to all those people who would have uh, you know somewhere or other in their life would have trodden to take would have like you know actually um would have taken an untrodden path ki are ye karne se kya milega wo karne se kya milega like epigraphs padhne se kya milega for me if you ask in one word what is the scope of epigraphy the scope of epigraphy is unlimited because in a country like india 85% of our past comes we like we know about 85% of our past from the inscriptions um they are a primary source they are they are definitely our primary source of studies and they are material evidences coming directly from the past they help us to set a lot of things right they give us direct hints at the dynasty the chronology and all these things but indirectly um indirectly is a wrong word but if decoded correctly they tell us many 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 small small things which actually help us to understand the peoples of the past rather than you know who just ruled when where and all those things uh, there are some dynasties whom we know today only because of their legends on the coins and their inscriptions so inscriptions have and are playing a very important role in you know telling us what india was really there are many types of inscriptions um epigraphs are also called as inscriptions so there are many types of them like proclamations uh, the the famous like the best example of a proclamation is the uh, deva naam priya dasi raja eva maha the one which uh, king ashoka has made 
Then we have prashastis, we have land grants, we have donative records, we have a lot of them. And these come to us in many languages and many scripts from all over India. So the scope of uh, epigraphy is just unlimited. Uh, the field of epigraphy, however, is not new. Many people have worked to lay, this, lay a foundation for this field. And they have actually set the stone in motion. Many scholars like Charles Wilkins, then we have James Princep who has deciphered the Brahmi and Karoshi script. It is a very interesting story that how James Princep actually deciphered the script. And to know about the story, you should join our Brahmi course, which is available on our website, www.instrucent.org. With the coming up of Archaeological Survey of India, we started publishing something called as the CII volumes, that is the Corpus Inscriptionum Indicarum, which mentioned in detail about certain dynasties. Like, so there is one CII volume on the Satavanas, there is one CII volume on uh, the Shilaharas, one CII volume on uh, the Kalachuris, you know, something like that. And these are corpuses in themselves about the inscriptions and the dynasty. Then we have a uh, rice, uh, sorry, I mean, not the Khanewala rice, but uh, B. Lewis rice, who prepared the gazetteer of Mysore and Kurk. And he also started the Epigraphia Karnataka volumes. With Epigraphia Karnataka, we also have Epigraphia Indica K volumes. And as uh, Kurush sir says, like from left, right, and center, everybody in those times started recording, reading, documenting, publishing, everything. And Every each and every aspect which they could understand about inscriptions in these volumes. Then we have scholars like Oja and Euler coming up for their uh, with their Indian paleographical studies and their books like the book of Bharatiya Prachin Lipi Mala is still considered to be one of the greatest books in the study of paleography and it is still referred by many of us. We also have like the studies of Indian epigraphy paced up with the establishment of the Epigraphical Society of India. And there are many, many, many more scholars who have like given their best to bring this field, you know, like given a lot to this field. And there are many, many, many people whose names have not, you know, survived the test of time. We don't know them, but they would have definitely contributed to the field of epigraphy. Now, with a strong foundation of 200 to 300 years of scholarship in this field, it would be in its zenith, right? Like every household will, would have had an epigraphist and every person there would, you know, want to pursue his or her career in epigraphy, right? But um, sadly, that's, that's not the case. Somehow, somewhere after 90s, I, what I feel is the field of epigraphy and epigraphical studies lost its charm. No one really wants to read an epigraphy epigraphs right now. Like it's like hey na sab wahan pe, wapas kyu padna hai? I mean that's the basic general perception that I have come across. Then uh, half the time people don't realize what is epigraphy. So you have to tell them ki acha inscriptions inscriptions ke liye padna hota hai. Jo ki uske diwaro pe likha hota hai, wo sach mein likha hai. Like it's not gibberish. You can read it if you learn the language, if you learn the script, and like what I have realized is people who use epigraphs as sources of studies, like the historians and archaeologists, they have actually limited epigraph, ep, I mean epigraphs to only studying the dynasties and dates. Like once you get the chronology out of the inscriptions, the inscriptions is just discarded away. The other small, small nuances are not understood, or maybe they are just like, you know. So it's okay, like the inscription is not important anymore. So what we are going to do today is we are going to take some selected epic um, inscriptions and then, um, you know, ask certain questions to them. Like, we are going to ask them this question, them as in the inscriptions. Or kya, matlab? dates or dynasties ke alawa or kya hai jo ye inscriptions bata sakte hai. what else can these inscriptions tell us apart from the dates and dynasties apart from being just chronological markers and the second question is to kya ha theek hai wo log humko ye sab cheezon ke bare mein bata sakte hai. but then to kya like why should i care so what like if these inscriptions tell us other things than just dates and dynasties I think we should care because it is in these things that the 
heritage of india the people of india are hidden so let's you know fasten your fasten our seat belt and just jump into this world of epigraphs and travel across time space you know there will be no barrier today we will visit as many as inscriptions as possible as many as time periods as possible and like you know just dive into the multiverse so our first pit stop in this multiverse journey is the kanheri caves because these caves are very close to my heart these caves are the primary clusters of caves of mumbai and amongst the other caves in and around mumbai there are approximately 120 caves in kanheri which tell us everything you want to know about hinayana mahayana and vajrayana buddhism uh, uh like the this site is unique because um this is an archaeological and a cultural heritage enclosed within a natural and a geological heritage so like this the kanheri caves are within sanjay gandhi national park in borivili maharashtra um and i find this very unique if you have ever heard about a cave complex which is within a national park and the center of city then please let me know in the chat box because i find this to be the unique example like i don't think there are any other caves like this especially in india so ha huh, coming back to kanheri caves the the these set of 120 caves are surrounded by ancient sites like nala sopara yeah guys you heard it correct nala sopara was a very important ancient fort and we still get a lot of remains of ancient trade from there so yeah nala sopara kalyan thane vasai you know these sites it's been surrounded by all these ancient sites and it is very close to a site called chaul about with about which riddhim talked yesterday so these i mean uh, being surrounded by such great ancient sites these caves reveal a lot a lot of things uh, these caves are corpuses in themselves like is a corpus in themselves uh, these caves have inscriptions in brahmi nagri pahlavi scripts in prakrit language sanskrit japanese language so um, before we like move on there is a difference between script and language script is something that we write and language is something that we talk uh, so like in today's whatsapp language when we type a a p k y a aap kya kar rahe ho ke liye so we are using the hindi language and writing in the roman script just to give you an example of how script and language works so amongst the 120 caves at kanheri i would like to talk about an inscription specifically from this cave This is the cave number eleven at Kanheri. Its interior design actually matches with the cave five at Ellora, and it functioned as a library of the monks at Kanheri. So, what is special about the inscription in this cave is that so the inscription which I'm going to talk about is not in these photographs. I found this inscription in the book published by Shobhna Ma'am, and just to give you how an insight on how inscriptions look like. these this is how you find inscriptions on the walls so yeah coming back to the inscription which i want to talk about the dynasty of of this inscription is the shilahara dynasty that inscription mentions about the shilahara dynasty uh, it also mentions about the rashtrakutas and it talks about a donation made by a person called as gomin avignakar and the date of this inscription is around 9th century so these are the general information that we get from the inscription now what are we supposed to ask to the inscription what else can they tell us apart from the dates and chronology and dynasties so the first thing that you come to know is that the donor gomen avignakar has come from gauda country now gauda country is basically a reference to bengal so a person has come from bengal to kanheri first thing that you come to know. the second thing that you come to know when you read this inscription carefully is in the end na there are witnesses mentioned so it's like mai so and so ko sakshi man kar ye daan deta hu something like that so that so, and these names of witnesses like and the name proper names are mentioned and my favorite and my like the most my most favorite part of this inscription is a mention of an imprecatory verse imprecation or an imprecatory verse is a curse that is mentioned in the end of the inscription so usually what we see today ki there is this board jahan pe likha hai trespassers are not allowed beware of dogs but in 9th century uh 
trespassers were actually given shrapes and which were unique and very deadly at the same time so the shrap in this says that the miscreant or the person who goes against whatever is said in the grant will be born at, will be born in the hells that is apna naraks of avichi and gumbhi paka and then will have to eat cow flesh vomited by dogs i repeat cow flesh vomited by dog this is a shrap to a person in 9th century and it is so gross that i don't think even the wo man versus food wala adam richman would want to try this kind of things so these are i mean if you just read this if you go beyond just the dynasties and the dates these are the things that you understand abhi what is the second question that we have to ask ki ye sab batata hai inscription so what to kya the first thing that i would like to comment here is when there was there were no flights no trains this person from bengal has come to kanheri all the way from bengal to kanheri also how come in the world where there was no social media people at bengal knew what is what kanheri is then why were witnesses needed people ko trust nahi tha kya ki govin avignakar jo kar raha hai donations de raha hai wo pakka dega hi ki there were there were uh, witnesses needed and suddenly and like discussing about the implication the matlab the the way they have thought matlab aisa implications jo aisa shrap jo maybe definitely nobody in the 21st century would like to try so 9th century mein the concept of hells the concept of sins would have been completely different so it comments on the social psych of people through these inscriptions now moving on to the next bit stuff are the caves of kuda now i am a bit biased about these caves because i feel that these caves are a paradise for the epigraphists uh, they are like if if kanheri was in borivili this is in raigad district of maharashtra near the rajapuri creek and uh, these caves are situated on the ancient trade route now you guys must be thinking ki main aise kaise bol sakti hu ki these are situated on an ancient trade route well maybe for that you will have to wait for instruction to bring out its report on manda excavations only then maybe you'll understand why i'm saying this okay coming back to kuda there are total of 31 inscriptions in kuda uh, they are big bold and crisp and why do i call it an epigraphist's paradise because whatever you, an epigraphist asks for is there inscriptions are bold and crisp inscriptions bold crisp and clear they are there inscriptions in prakrit and Bra- like brahmi brahmi script and prakrit language they are there inscription in sanskrit and nagari they are there so in at one side we have like two different sets of uh, inscriptions so period wise you can then analyze and there's a lot of things which an epigraphist can think when they hear these kind of things then inscription by royal people it's there inscriptions by commoners it's there inscription by nuns and monks it's there i mean it everything is there at kuda and also the site is very easily accessible you can almost take the car up to the gate so and that is one thing and even you don't have to climb much so everything is there at kuda so that is why i call i mean i feel it is a it is an epigraphist uh, par- paradise so we will discuss only two inscriptions from kuda and they are these ones so the first inscription is if you can if anybody can from the audience can read brahmi they'll realize that the first word it says say reveal the name of the dynasty which is the mahabojas and these existed in the first century ce and second century ce ke aas pass so now once the chronology is set what do we ask the inscription what else so when you read this inscription you will realize that a donation was made by a person called as shivama and um, he is related to a royal scribe called as shivabhuti and donation like in this inscription the donations have not only been made by these people but also the wife of shivamma and the daughters of shivamma so i say what do we understand the first thing that we understand is in first first or second century ce a royal scribe earned so much that he could give donations guys here i mean why i am emphasizing on this is donations is something you give only when you have more you don't give it when you are like you know just existing hand to mouth 
you give it only when you have extra so a royal scribe could give donations and the second thing is that in a time where women were considered to be very abla we have an example of of, of women giving donations here so i mean it changes our pers perspective of the past so i mean this is what an inscription can do if you ask them the questions like what else and so what the second inscription which i have deliberately chosen here is a broken inscription uh, again a person who can read basic dhammi will realize that the first word which is written is is mahabhojan so kya abhi but abhi dynasty ho gaya date ho gaya and inscription toota hua hai to chhod dene ka kya nahi chhodne ka nahi because there are a lot of small small things which these inscription tell us as simple as abhi's photo it's not seen but if you read the the letters properly it is mahabhojaya so all those people who have some knowledge about uh, the uh, sanskrit or you know prakrit language like that you will understand that the when you say bhojaya it indicates a, to a female donor like a female person so most probably this inscription is don like this donation would have been made by a lady and the second line if you read it reads as mandavya mandavya is it like have you heard this name before i think you have because it talks about the place called as mandava so some you know these are those hidden ways in which inscription tell us like they hint give us hints we have to understand and forget about if these things would have not existed just the symbol in the starting is a hippocampus symbol and that is a marker of an indo roman trade so can you see how inscriptions actually tell us about a lot of things more than just the dynasty the year and setting the chronological set like giving us a chronology they tell us more about it abhi bahut ho gaya maharashtra ke bare mein let's move a bit north to the heliodorus pillar inscription everybody knows about this inscription and i'm sure that like this inscription is taught in our history and archaeology syllabus and they don't skip it because it is a very important inscription why is it an important inscription because it is a garuda pillar inscription by heliodorus a greek ambassador who has been sent by an indo greek king antiochus to india during the reign of bhagabhadra who is a shila uh, sorry not a shilahara who is a shunga king this is the reason why this inscription is taught and also because in this inscription the the it's mentioned that deva dev this has been given for deva deva sa vasudeva it has a lot of religious importance now what we have to ask to the inscription after knowing the basic description what else and so what so what else does this inscription tell us that first of all if you read the inscription properly the name of heliodorus's father is mentioned second he came from takshashila third is that when you read the inscription you will realize that bhagabhadra is called kasi putra bhagabhadra and here kasi is the name of mother how we have gautami putra satakarni you know something like in those lines but gautami putra satakarni came much later before them we before like this inscription predates the satakarni so that is there then uh antiochus the greek ruler he is termed as maharajasa antiochidas but uh, the bhagabhadra the shunga ruler he is mentioned as ranyo bhagabhadra sa and then he is mentioned tratarasa so these are the information that you find now from this what can we make up is that first thing why was this pillar even erected epigraphs can never be understood in isolation you have to understand uske aaju baaju ke sare cheeze and when excavations were conducted here people realized people as in scholars and academics academicians realized that there were um like uh, will they found ancient temple remains here so this pillar was not just erected like that it was erected in front of some ancient temples so there was some kind of ritual worship happened worship happening here a uh, ritual or not we don't know um why did heliodorus even come to like from takshashila to this place i don't know maybe you can find an answer to it 
uh you can also understand the prominence of the vrish the cult of vrishni heroes the name vasudeva mentioned here is a part of a five hero vrishni cult including him we have uh, um balarama that is sankarshan pradyumna anirudh and uh, sambha this actually it is this cult which got assimilated amalgamated integrated or maybe expanded itself into vaishnavism another interesting thing which we can ask like we can you know ask this inscription is why is uh, the indo greek king anti alkidas mentioned as maharaja maharaja sir but the shunga king just mentioned as a ranyu or a raja is it because there was some difference in their uh, maybe like was the indo greek king more stronger we don't know what it can be and these are the small things that we have we have to look for in an inscription now coming back to our very own cosmopolitan overcrowded amchi mumbai this inscription was lying silently in the barc campus and many of us watching this live today will know the this do know the history of its discovery and everything this has brought in like it's it's a new dish in the plate of mumbai ka epigraphy Uh, mumbai ka epigraphs and the epigraphical studies that we can do in and around mumbai this uh, the entire details of this inscription how it was found and how it changed the history of mumbai has been mentioned already by kurur sir in his first lecture so if you have missed that please go and catch up that lecture because it was a very interesting lecture what intrigued me in this inscription is the word tatpada padmopaji hambir rao um he was an uh, like he was a local ruler and is inscription ke pehle bhi aur is inscription ke baad ke bhi dates ke humko uske inscriptions mile hain there he does not tell himself proclaim himself to be uh, a tatpada padmopa jeevi to ferosha tugla in those inscriptions he is very like you know i am i me myself i am the great i am the independent ruler but in uh, this inscription somehow he is telling that i am you know i am a vassal of firoshatulak why why all of a sudden is hambira saying this like aisa kya ho gaya hambira ke jeevan mein ki usko jab ye inscription banwa raha tha tab usko bolna pada ki nahi mereko bolna padega ki i am a vassal and i am not an independent ruler and i'm not going to answer this please see guru sir's lecture he has already mentioned this so these are the small things that you know dheere dheere se we come to know about the psyche of like the mental state of the rulers the people of those times small hints that tell us about like the people of the past then you make them more human when you come to know uh, and study inscriptions now going north again this is the famous mathura inscription of chandragupta who is the son, chandragupta 2 who is the son of samudragupta uh everybody knows about the gupta dynasty because i mean i'm sure so not like we'll not discuss about the history and all that of the gupta dynasty this inscription dates back to the 4th century ce because the name chandragupta 2 is mentioned so what else do the inscription tell us first thing that it tells us is to uh, so in inscription when the dates are mentioned they are usually mentioned as samvat shaka you know something like that but here in this inscription they use the word kalanu um, kalanu vartamane or you know that that kind of word which is very unique and a, a different which has led the you know led scholars and uh, academicians to discuss about this word especially about this word then what does this inscription tell us about it tells us about construction of the shrines of two gurus upamita and kapila now this is what the inscription tell us so you can definitely ask me ki ha bata itna like itsme kaun si badi baat hai shrines hi to kar rahe na construct shrines to karte hi hai construct isme kaun si badi baat hai to badi baat isme ye hai ki if you understand who were upamita and kapila you will realize that these people were acharyas of the pashupata sect pashupata sect is a sect of shaivism and the like it suddenly puts pashupata shaivism on the map of gupta dynasty 
you also understand the importance of acharyas in this period acharyas as in teachers in this period and how they were venerated and this inscription talks about something called as guru vayatana where the worships of gurus are done and this entire tradition of veneration of gurus is not new in the gupta period it had already started long back right from the you know uh, from first second century bce itself because at bhaje a cave near lonavala you see a memorial gallery only venerating the monks of buddhism buddhism ha buddhism and at karli also you have a memorial pillar which talks which which talks about a uh, venerating a senior person you know in in this in the buddhist field so things like this have already been initiated and it's just that they are uh, culminating in different ways in different centuries in different dynasties more about the bhaje and karle memorial gallery and memorial pillar do join us on 5th of feb when riddhi and i take you to these caves okay okay now coming back to inscriptions again uh, as i was saying that inscriptions are not just about the dynasties and about the kings now let's go to south why are we not going to south just a minute and try to understand what the inscription of the chudamani vihara tries to tell us so this chudamani vihara is a buddhist monastery at nagapattinam in tamil nadu nagapattinam in tamil nadu um it now the date of this dynasty i won't reveal uh okay chalo i'll tell you what this dynasty like what what date is this inscription up to ye us dynasty ka inscription hai which became famous only because of the movie uh, only after the movie ponni selvam yes that's correct it is dated to the dynasty of chola period so the content of this inscription states that a king called as mara vijaya uh, mara vijaya tunga varman of shri vijaya dynasty has constructed this monastery with the patronage of raja raja chola varman so now the dynasty is clear the date is clear and now the chronology is set so what the question that we have to ask the inscription is what else if you focus on this word shri vijaya you will understand that this shri vijaya that the king is coming from is none other than present day sumatra in indonesia this in one line comments about the maritime relations maritime trade maritime annexations that uh cholas had in you know their in in do, in their times with the southeast asia and east asian countries and i won't comment more upon this to know more please join us from on like from 5th december when dr kurush dalal talks about the civilizations of southeast asia apart from these uh, this inscription uh, they have found around 350 bronzes of buddha dating to uh, 11th to 16th century so like this site is very important acha now moving on to next inscription i think we have enough time to discuss yeah so moving on any guesses which this inscription can be it's an inscription of the sudarshan lake by it's the junagadh rock inscription of rudra daman to be very specific from girnar that is gujarat uh, who is this rudra daman that i'm talking about he is the he is one of the important kings of western chhatrapas western chhatrapa is a dynasty that ruled over india and this inscription can be dated back to around uh, second century ce uh, the content of this inscription includes a great eology a great prashasti of the king rudra daman uh where and after that he talks about like this inscription talks about the repairs that were carried by him and like repairs that were conducted around the sudarshan day this inscription actually mentions that pehle ye clay ka jo kaam tha wo mauryan rulers ne kiya hua tha chandragupta and ashoka ne and that this king is just adding up to the works because the lake just got destroyed due to storms when rudra daman was ruling and this again like this lake sudarshan lake features again in the skanda gupta's inscription a ruler from the gupta dynasty around 5th century ce so 
this lake was like very famous like ek ke baad ek ke baad rulers are coming and you know talking about this particular lake and the constructions and the restorations that they have done so once you realize ki what else the inscription can tell us you have to ask the question so what so the first thing that we learn from this inscription is rudra daman was against pleasureism he made sure that he gives credit to mauryan rulers कि भाई पहले मॉरियंस आए थे उन्होंने ये काम किया था मैं तो बस उसके ऊपर ऐड कर रहा सो दिस इज समथिंग व्हिच वी एकेडमिशियंस यंग स्कॉलर्स एंड ऑल दैट शुड लर्न कि वी शुड नॉट प्लेजर द सेकंड थिंग दैट एक्चुअली केम टू मी व्हेन आई वाज डिस्कसिंग अबाउट दिस इंस्क्रिप्शन विद माय फ्रेंड धैर्य व्यास इज ही टोल्ड मी लाइक व्हेन आई एम एन इंस्क्रिप्शन एंथुसियास्ट सो आई ओनली स्पीक अबाउट इंस्क्रिप्शंस एंड नाउ पीपल अराउंड मी हैव गॉट यूज्ड टू इट so when we were discussing about this inscription dhairya told me that this inscriptions like these which tell us about the irrigation facilities or you know lakes constructed on these lines actually tell us about the catchment analysis like help us in the catchment analysis of that area they tell us ki kaha pani so pani is the basic need of humans so ek bar you understand where pani was located you can understand ki aaju baaju ke sites kahan ho sakte hain where where can be the potential sites for explorers and everything so thank you dhairyo for like you know opening my eye towards that kind of aspect of inscriptions which i would have never heard i would have never thought of so this is one thing which this these are the things that come out of rudra daman's inscription now let's go to south of girnar that is again into maharashtra at nane ghat so nane ghat houses the famous inscription of naganika who was naganika naganika was a queen of satavahanas her husband was satakarni ban uh, this inscription is again dated around 1st century ce uh, this inscription tells us about the queen naganika in detail who was she where she came from and etc everything about her it also talks about the satavahana kings in general kingdom in general and and, and satakarni and it talks about in detail about the yagnas performed in those times it starts with a verse which pays obsequies to uh, indra sankarshan vasudev vasudev the sun god the dikpalas etc and it ends with the meritorious donations that naganika granted during the uh commencement and ending of these in these um, yagnas so what so once you understand the content you have to ask the inscription what else and so what indirectly if you decode this inscription properly this tells us about the beliefs of the past the myths of the past which were the yagnas that were to be performed which were given more prominence what was the belief system the ritual uh, approach of people in maybe first century ce again why this ins inscription is very important according to me is because it has brahmi numerals in it every time that naganika has mentioned that i have donated 2400 karshapanas with the words the numbers are also mentioned or 6001 karshapanas you know she goes on saying like this so with the words the number like the numbers and the words they go hand in hand so that is something which is very new and very less that we see in inscriptions and here what you can see is the way they wrote or engraved zero was just by making a dot and it is only in the later centuries like i think in the 11th century in the sahastra bahu temple in gwalior where you can see the actual modern symbol of zero the one that we write the circle so small small hints from inscription can tell us how we moved on from writing num like just from like writing number names to numbers and you know all these things they help us to track not only the archaeological history but also the numerical history of india the next that we are going to talk about ha huh, why should we move on uh the caves at nane ghat are not only um, important because of the inscription by naganika but also for for something that is called as the pratima gruha of the satavahana kings there were once upon a time sculptures and actually royal portrait sculptures of many of the satavahana kings here but today we don't know 
Now, like we don't have any evidence of sculptures. We only have their feet or something like that. And how do we know? But how do we know that these uh, sculptures were there? It is because of the inscriptions. Sculptures have not survived, but the inscriptions below them have names like Simuka um, or you know Satakarni, sir, you know something like that, which tells us about कि हाँ एक टाइम पे यहाँ पे पूरा पूरा स्टैचू था and these were like label these are something called which we call as label inscriptions. The similar thing you can see at Sannati where the portrait of Ashoka was you know like there is uh, there is it is said that at Sannati there is a portrait of Ashoka. And you come to know that this is the portrait of Ashoka of that century only because there is an inscription on it saying Rayo Ashoka. Till, till then we did not have any face for Ashoka, but now we do have. So that is how inscriptions play a very important role, not only in like archaeological point of view, but also from the iconographical point of view. Many sculptures, one such Example can be the Bhairaghat 64 Yoginis, which my friend Momita Mazumdar explored for her dissertation project on Chamunda, where she told me that sculptures like these have niche chota chota inscriptions, the label inscriptions, ki kiska sculpture ho sakta hai. Every other 64 Yogini in the Bhairaghat uh, circle has a name to her. So you understand whether it is a Sarvato Mukhi Yogini or whether she's an Indra Jali or an Antakari, you know, etc. By just an inscription. If sculpture is broken, you at least don't go. People who are studying iconography will be very upset when I say this. But from an epigraphical point of view, you can still understand that yes, there was a sculpture Even if the sculpture gets... The, everything is not lost, is what my point is. Uh, in an article uh, by, you know, Sivaram Murthy, iconographic gleanings from epigraphy, he mentions a lot of in sculptures like that, which have been identified only on their basis of their inscriptions. And many of Jain Tirthankaras and Bodhisattvas have been such that they have identical iconographies, but only because of their names, you can distinguish between them. Ki achha, ye, ye hai, to wo, wo hai. And these have been reported a lot from Mathura and Bengal. So inscriptions can help us in like it is it is a multiverse. It is multidisciplinary. It it is a source in itself, but at the same time, it is helping to you know uh, raise increase your interest in different fields like iconography. And also one such field in which inscriptions are very important or play a very important role is the studies of numismatics. What epigraphists call as inscriptions. In the numismatic terminologies, it is called as legend. And this simple legend of, again, our famous Rudradam, Rudradaman, who was against pleasurism, tells that if you just read what is written, Ranyo Shatrapasa, Jayadama Putrasa, Ranyo Mahakshatrapasa, Rudradamasa. So this coin is of Rudradaman. The first thing that hits to my eyes, Rudradaman is a Mahakshatrapa, but Jayadama, his father, is just a Shatrapa. So within the next generation, a generation, the importance of Kshat this Shatrapa family would have increased, that's the titles would have changed. And so this is how the inscription actually tells us about how the society was changing with time and with tide. Uh, when we are discussing about hard surfaces, copper plates again play a very important role in um, in the studies of inscriptions. Copper plates are basically, tam, we, in, like in re local language, we call it tamapatras. And uh, they are actually to be treated as property papers. Like they, they usually revolve around land donations. And many people still have this at their home. So this is like very, uh, very nice and very good way of documenting land donations from the ancient time period. This particular... Uh, copper plate is of a Parmara king, Siyaka II, uh, where he is giving uh, donations to of villages to certain Brahmins. What intrigues me in the copper plate and what else should the copper plate tell us is, uh, apart from the donation dynasties and the chronology, is the titles that are used by the kings. Matlab, ek se ek hai. 
I'll just give you some examples of some titles. Like there are people, there are uh, copper plates saying that this person is a Raja. He's a Maharaja Di Raja. He's a Parma Bhattakara. He's a Samanta Adhipati. He's the one who has attained all the five Mahasabdas. His horse have drunk the water of Ganges. I mean, in some of the Konkan inscriptions, they are like, he is Konkan Adhipati. He is this, he is that. I mean, every other person who has some knowledge of Sanskrit and loves Sandhi Vigraha, unke le to matlab ye jannat hai. Ek se padkar ek Sandhi Vigraha hoti hai si. And like, I mean, people are just so creative about these titles. And I had come across one, in, uh, one copper plate grant of 12th century. It's just a single uh, copper plate grant with one side where there are 12 lines in it. 11 lines, trust me, only talk about titles. This king, king of kings, wo ye, ye mahan, usne ye kya, usne wo kya. Uske saamne to, matla, wo ek baar apne aap ki sunne, to ek baar usne commitment kar li, to wo apne aap ki bhi nahi sunta, you know, something on those lines. And then in the last line, donated lines to Brahman. This is what the entire copper plate tells the readers. So what if, so what are, so what is this indicating it? To kya, matla, isse kya nikalna chahiye? Ki, like I, don't know, but the general question which comes to my mind is why were such heavy titles used for the kings? Well, that's limit that you are saying that king the great, ye, wo, aise, aise. you're telling about the kings and his achievements. Hai. But why do they have to be overemphasized with using these titles? People did not trust yeah, their king saying that I know that Why were they supposed to be emphasized on these copper plates? Now, I don't have an answer to it. If anybody has an answer to it, then please let me know as to why were there so many titles used in copper plates. But yeah, these are these are some things that you can think about, right? There was one time where uh, Ashoka was just happy with Beloved of Gods. Now suddenly why so many titles are coming. Small, small things, right? These are the small, small things that you can discuss when you uh, start reading and decoding the inscriptions layer by layer. Having discussed the importance of epigraphs and, you know, telling that they tell us so many more things than just the kings and the dynasties. Why is it that the inscriptions, you know, are not in the limelight? That is because the studies of inscriptions are very tough. Some of the times you might not find an inscription. Some of the times the inscription would be broken. So you would not be able to read it. You have to be like, you have to have a good knowledge of language like Sanskrit and Prakrit and know a lot of things, have patience most of the times, read things, reread a lot of things. It requires a lot of patience. It is a painstaking job and it is not as rosy. Like whatever I have been telling is the works and like, you know, of scholars who have put their sweat, blood, everything into it. So yeah, the field of epigraphy is a bit tough. Most of the times it might happen that just like this Heliodorus pillar, there are two inscriptions, one that we discussed and one which is this, which talks about the Tini Amruta Padani, which do not really, you know, uh, like iska matlab abhi tak people have not found. Scholars have been discussing about this again and again and again over centuries, but still we don't know what exactly this inscription tells us. Then we have the Estam pages, which make at some points, they, at some point of time, they really make the life of an epigraphist tough because they um, actually a stampage karne ka process hai hota hai ki you mark each and every uh, engraving or each and every uh, broken part of the stone. So, it happens sometimes that the cuts of the matra, like matra hai ki wo stone ka problem hai, that does not get clear. So, the reading becomes difficult. There are a lot of issues. Then there is this entire cough of dying early if you uh, you know, if you are a paleographist, um, like I have heard people saying that it, and it is actually a fact that James Princep died very early at the age of 37. And many people who are doing paleography, uh, who have actually deciphered script have died at the, at an early age, but just tell me that would epigraphical studies be possible without a James Princep or the, you know, or the contributions of James Princep? People are just scared that inscriptions are jaldi mar jayenge, but that is not true. I mean, people, ha, I'm sure the epigraphists have definitely lived, uh, not the epigraphists, the paleographists have lived less. But I mean, they are the perfect examples of the kahavat ne ki zindagi badi honi chahiye, lambi nahi. We will, we cannot forget James Princep 
I mean, till the time the discussions of Brahmi don't end. And then there is general apathy towards the field of archaeology and uh, epigraphy, paleography, and heritage and all such things. But still, there are few people who are, you know, taking efforts and trying to break these stereotypes. One of so one of such one of such story of a person or people are the people at Mythic Society who are trying to do like who have started the project of digital scanning of all the epigraphs in and around Bangalore. And one of the epigraphs that they understood was they came uh, in like, which came under their study in Bangalore was this inscription. This is a very important inscription for all the people of Bangalore and especially for all the Indians, because this is the first time ever the word Bangalore is mentioned in this inscription. This inscription is also important because it is the oldest known Kannada inscription language and script wise, and it predates the work of Kaviraja Mayuga, which like pushes the boundaries of Kannada language and Kannada script to almost by 100 years. Uh, it also talks about this person called as Kittaya, who uh, actually fought bravely and, uh, you know, against the, uh, again, fought against all the odds. And he tried to save this entire place of Bangalore, making Kittaya the first ever documented citizen of the, of the city of Bangalore. So these are small glimpses which inscription can, inscriptions can tell us and like, you know, they can connect us to our heritage. Uh, what people at Mythic Society do is they uh, they ex they have explored the fields and you know the the way we did our Salset project जहाँ पे हमने कोने कोने से जाके हर एक चीज़ explore किया about Mumbai city in the similar way these people have been exploring uh, every gully and every lane of Bangalore and trying to find out such inscriptions they saved this inscription which talks about Bangalore and pushes back the layer the horizon of Kannada's uh, the language Kannada and the script Kannada by 100 years, uh, they saved it from being dumped into a road development project. And what they do is they, they uh, do a 3D scanning of this inscription and I have their entire corpus. What does the 3D scanning helps us to do is, it helps us to read this inscription. Very clearly, very properly, without making a mistake whether uh, without you know blaming the stamp page ki house mein marker hai nahi hai kya hai you clearly know ki ha kya likha hai in this inscription i came to know about this inscription and the people of mythic society in a conference at of the epigraphical society of india at uh, bhu where they showed their work and where they talked about their work in more detail and when they presented this particular inscription on screen suddenly Every other senior epigraphist in the room who had actually, you know, मतलब सर पटक पटक के stamp page के ऊपर एक एक line पढ़ने का कोशिश किया होगा, जिसने आंख खराब किया होगा. Every other person who has an has ever tried reading an stamp page actually started clapping कि wow, this is actually a magic that was done by them. So small efforts like these are actually trying to of connecting people to their heritage is helping in the epigraphical studies. This is how the inscriptions has been preserved now. This is now this, I mean, there are ways in which the inscription can get damaged, but the best part of it is it has been documented and digitized. So this inscription abhi amar rahega. This is again a way of reading a project by Mythic Society. And this inscription talks about the famous cities of Bangalore, like uh, Kannahalli, which is next to Sarjapur Road and all such things. Apart from what all we have discussed today, I have not covered even the one hundredth of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of epigraphs. I mean, there is so much to that, so much to add to the plate. Because of my limitations, we have not discussed, I mean, I could not discuss any of the Arabic and the Persian inscriptions. I don't know what kind of data lies there, you know, when you talk in those inscriptions, because I have not explored them. There are, so these are the things. So when you talk about the heritage of India. Are the rulers, the politicians, the administrators, the heritage of India? Are, are they only the heritage of India? No, the heritage of India is about the people who make them these rulers, who make, who make like we talk, today we say that because of some dynasty, there was a golden era. So who made this golden era? The people of the dynasty made this 
a golden era and epigraphs are the way to connect to the people they are our very own heritage they tell stories of normal day commoners ki unhone thoda extra effort leke donate kiya unhone thoda yahan se idhar se travel karke wo udhar aaya unhone ye kiya they are ways to connect to the people they are ways to connect to our ancestors and that is why thank you first of all thank you for being a very patient listener because uh, people get bored when i talk about inscriptions so that is one thing and whenever you hear the word inscription or are dealing with inscriptions don't forget to ask these two questions or kya and to kya to the inscriptions thank you and have a nice day